Will. Hello, Internet. My name is Will Wheaton, and I am in my office here in fabulous Los Angeles. Joining me today through the magic of a series of tubes, uh, Greg Cook from the, uh, it looks like you are in the beautiful Stone Bistro Beer Garden, Greg, is that correct? That is right, on a, a wonderful Southern California afternoon, and it uh, turns out I'm, I'm armed with beer. Just and, how you uh, do it right. And also uh, from Dogfish Head Craft Brewery in Delaware, Sam Calagione. Hello, Sam. Hello, Will. Hello, Greg. And now uh, the third member of this year's uh, collaboration, uh, Bill Kowaleski, is supposed to be joining us, but he is apparently having uh, technical difficulties with his computer. He has turned it off and back on again. That didn't solve the problem, so we're going to go get started. <laughs> Uh, without Bill, and hopefully Bill will be joining us at, uh, at some point in time. So uh, for everyone who is watching at home or wherever you are, the reason that we are all here today is to celebrate the Saison de Buff. This is a collaboration beer that is made by Greg and Sam and Bill's breweries, and it has an actual uh, history that goes all the way back to around 2003 with the forming of a group called Buff. And Greg, I was wondering if you would be willing to share with the world uh, where uh, Buff came from, and then we will open our first beer. Uh, okay, absolutely, Will. I'd be delighted to do that, except for the order that you just put those in, because, uh, frankly, I'm getting a little thirsty, so I may... Yeah. Um, oh, go, well, please, go right ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for that uh, permission. I appreciate it. Okay, so Buff. Brewers United for Freedom of Flavor. Back in 2003, uh, actually it was uh, tough for us to get the any media attention, which seems a little hard to believe right now in 2012. But in 2003, it was, uh, yeah, we, we were just weren't getting attention. So we thought, well, if the three of us banded together and we created this manifesto, this kind of fiery manifesto, actually, and formed the organization called Brewers United for Freedom of Flavor, we would be able to uh, get some attention. So, uh, how did that go? What's that? Uh, how did that go? Yeah. Uh, well, um, we had a press release or a press conference actually in right. Boston, and one person showed up. One person. Do you Jamie. remember who that was? Yeah, it was Jamie McGee from uh, Yankee Brew News. Uh, and I always going to toast Jamie for, for being there for us. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, nobody else gave a rat. So, so. So, uh, so Sam, let's, let's fast forward a, a little bit. You guys are, uh, you're an ad hoc group. You're the Brewers United for Freedom of Flavor. You are sticking it to the fizzy yellow beer that we all hate. And uh, you guys decide that you're going to work together to do, a, uh, to do a collaboration beer. How did that come around? Uh, well, as uh, as Greg said, we uh, the day that we kind of did this in 2003, and we thought we'd have a big uh, megaphone, and it really turned into a very intimate <laughs> conversation among <laughs> three friends. After Jamie said, "Okay, guys, thanks uh, for coming. I'm leaving," and uh, we just chatted about the challenges in the industry, and you know, in that era, we were curious if we even had a future, if craft beer was going to get marginalized out of existence or if we'd be around and so sometime I think in 09 or 2010 we were back together at an event and we kind of gave each other high fives and said look at us you know we're still around and not only are we around but craft beer is thriving and growing how funny is it that you know we've been united for all these years and it took like what seven six years uh, for Buff to really feel like it was getting traction so to celebrate that, we said, let's do a beer together. So um, this is the, uh, I'm opening mine uh, also, by the way. This is, uh, I'm starting with the Dogfish Head version. And uh, this is a Saison, right? Now, uh, I actually homebrewed a Saison yesterday. Uh, it's bubbling behind me. And it's the first time I've ever done this particular style. Uh, would you talk a little bit about, for people who just don't know, like what the style is and what makes the collaboration special? Sure. Well, you're you're fermenting that w relatively warm, I imagine. Saisons tend to ferment warm. 
Yeah, I'm doing the Saison this time of year because it is such a pain in the ass to get things down to like 68. Yep. So if I just stick it in a water bath in my office, I can keep it right around 76 and yep. uh, then pop it out there and drive it up to 80 when, uh, when it's time to let the yeast really take off. Yep, so it's lots, lots of wheat in the recipe, uh, a spicy Belgian yeast uh, meant to be drunk in the summer, uh, re relatively traditional beer. I'd, I'd say the benchmark of the actual Belgians is Cezanne DuPont. Uh, so when we were brainstorming and name storming, that was kind of in our minds a little bit. We all certainly have great respect for that beer. But, you know, we wanted to, we're all three of our breweries, and Greg, Bill, and myself are kind of as much music geeks as we are beer geeks. So we were thinking about herbs coming out of the ground in the summer when Saisons are being drunk. And I think the first one to get discussed was rosemary. That was safe. And then, I, I was remember it? different. I remember it different because you said, if I remember right, hey, what about a Saison, guys? Would you think about brewing a Saison? We could, you know, have some fun with it. And I'm like, I always wanted to do a Saison with some sage. And then you guys, then you and Bill took it from there. That's how I, feel, I remember it. I feel, <laughs> like you're, I feel like you're ethnic profiling me with all your gesticulations with your hands. <laughs> My, um, my, 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 notes um, how about <laughs> my, my notes that I took to be prepared to, to uh, attempt to moderate this uh, tell me that in 2010, you did Parsley, Sage, Rosemary, and Thyme, which sort of fits with you guys being music nerds. Uh, Greg, uh, let's talk about 2012, when, uh, when you guys got together. You all got together at the Craft Brewers Conference, and what happened? Yeah, we, we actually planned it in advance because, uh, you know, really that's a good way to make sure you got all the ingredients and everything. But we talked about it. We loved the, the versions that we all three had done in 2010 so much um, that we, we thought a repeat was in, in order. Uh, frankly, I, and I'm not sure about these guys and, and the collaborations that they've done, but it's the first time that we've ever repeated a collaboration at Stone. Um, there's others that we would love to do too, but you know we, we took advantage of the fact that we were all three together at the Craft Brewers Conference here in San Diego just a few months back this past spring to get together and and do it again. And uh, frankly, I, I, so I just opened the Dogfish Head version, um, which I have had less of because I actually have to go to the store to buy that here in San Diego versus the Stone version, which uh, I can just take some home with me. So I'm a little bit more used to this one. And this one is, frankly, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a delight. Um, it's a little more modest in ABV because evidently uh, uh, this yeast strain is a, a little more kickback, laid back, lazy, whatever you want to call it when it's out in Delaware uh, versus the hardworking SoCal lifestyle of go, 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 because ours got bumped up a little higher. Is that it, Sam? Do you think that's an uh, accurate read? It's not super scientific. Wait until you try... Bill's Amish yeast strains. <laughs> Super hard working, simple little single cell folk, right. very effective. You're right. Um, yeah, I wouldn't know anything about uh, sort of that. <laughs> Greg, um, I was actually under the impression that you just reached into your beard and produced beer from there. You know what? Um, the number of people that have asked me about yeast from my beard, for as as to personally, is disturbing. And the answer is no, and never, and no, thank you. And can we talk about something else? Go. Uh, my uh, my wife would, would would be very unhappy with me if I did not uh, convey the following to you. If you are considering doing a collaboration, a re do it, redoing a collaboration at Stone, we would be very very happy if you did the TBA or if you did uh, the green tea IPA because they're super freaking good. Awesome. And we're, and we're crazy about them. Duly noted. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, Sam, um, uh, Greg points out that some things are a little bit different uh, in the, you know, it, the stone version is, has slightly higher ABV, uh, uh, the victory and the dogfish head have the same ABV, but I think the homebrewers would be really interested to hear about uh, how local conditions contribute to the same recipe being brewed different ways, your weather, your water, humidity, things like that. Well, I mean, the, the highest volume ingredient in any beer is obviously water, and we get ours from a deep aquifer well right here in uh, Milton. 
uh, treat it. So water is definitely a component that stays different. Our, our barley and our hops are pretty stable. So the other big uh, factor that you'll see the variance in is probably the herbs. Um, we have a, uh, one of my best friends uh, here, Zeke, is an herb dealer. Not what you two are thinking. Uh, <laughs> well, I totally got to get his number from you, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> he has a company, he and his wife Lisa, called Washington's Green Grocers. And he's also a surfer, and to keep the herbs in good shape, he takes the, he gets the herbs uh, wherever he gets them, don't ask, don't tell. And then uh, loads them into the surf bag because it's insulated and, and brings them to us. You know, I remember uh, the first time we did it, 2010, and we did the brew at Dogfish Head. Uh, we seem to have run into technical issues uh, with, uh, with Greg down there at the fabulous brewery. So, um, Sam, uh, continue, please. You were talking about how you, uh, you have different, different herbs, and, and uh, they're, they're going to be different, right? Because herbs sort of take up what's in the soil, and the soil is going to be different wherever you are. Yeah. Hey, I'm back. Oh, hello. <laughs> the, frozen, the frozen you, I thought, was you just trying to think about what you were going to say next. That does happen. <laughs> so yeah, our herbs all come from the Washington area, the local area. Uh, little known fact, because we, uh, you know, not really, we didn't really promote it, but I was lucky enough to hang out with Sam, the uh, White House chef, when we did an event together in New York City, and he's a home brewer, and uh, we got chatting, and he actually invited us to visit his homebrew uh, area in the in the White House, and. I them in our freezer, and then on Saison de Buff Day, we added a little very uh, patriotic herb mix to to this Saison de Buff. That's so cool. It was a fun day. Uh, so I just watched uh, Brewing TV come uh, to see you guys, and I really loved that you encourage your... Uh, oh, I think we've lost Sam again. Uh, I'm so here. Oh, good. All right. You've locked. That was just this frozen. That was this uh, high school yearbook pose, actually. <laughs> um, I think it's so cool that you encourage people who work at the brewery to homebrew and to do small batches. And I know that Stone uh, sponsors fantastic homebrew events down at the bistro all the time. And I've noticed that there is a wonderful spirit of collaboration among craft brewers, that there doesn't seem to be this idea that it's a zero-sum game. Like, I cannot imagine macro breweries that make that fizzy, pissy, awful beer that we just, that is just, that makes people think beer's terrible. I cannot imagine those guys ever working together because they're... I, 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 didn't, I didn't catch that well. I'm sorry, could you just repeat that last part? It, it, didn't, it was garbled. It didn't come through. I said the macro brewers who make that fizzy, pissy, yellow, disgusting beer that makes people think they're not going to like beer. Would, I could never see them working together the way I see craft brewers work together. And the way that I see craft brewers get excited about working together. And uh, I wonder if that sort of stems from craft breweries being built from the ground up by people who start out as home brewers. I'll, I'll comment on that. Uh, first of all, you know, I, I, I think the big brewers are actually really good at brewing quality beer. It's probably something not, that I don't crave 99.8% uh, of the time that I'm, I'm drinking beer. But when, after a, a hockey game or hot day in the sun, I actually don't mind a nice cold can of a uh, light lager. Uh, that said, I'd rather have a, a can of a great IPA uh, from a small craft brewery. Um, but, you know, I, 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 I recognize... Coast, is it a PC thing? Is it, it's just East Coast and West Coast. We're not as, you know, inclined that way. <laughs> it, it could be that. I mean... I have I my first love is obviously my brethren in the craft brewing industry, but I also get anxiety that beer in general is lo losing market share to wine and spirits, uh, even though craft beer is growing. 
that's uh, that's pretty that's pretty uh, troubling as well as an overall trend. Uh, you know, well, I, I think I mean I, I I should as a as a brewing aficionado and as someone who hopes to one day own a brew pub, uh, uh, I should say that I have respect for the brewers who can make unbelievable amounts of of uh, the macro brew that I can't stand and 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 do it really well. And I know that a lot of those guys leave, you know, come from huge macro breweries, and they come to craft breweries, and they're like, "Yes, I'm a craft brewery. I can make beer that I'm excited about." Um, uh, I'm, I think it's cool that uh, that craft beer is starting to be canned. Do you guys have a, an opinion on that? Well, yeah. Can, can we get into that in a second? Because I actually want to go back for just a second and answer your previous question. Yes. If you don't mind, and, and also on the idea of you know respect for the volumes, you know, uh, yeah, we got to give respect to the the pre-wrapped cheese slice guys for the incredible volumes of pre-wrapped cheese slices that they're able to turn out, and we should certainly give the guys that figured out how to freeze dry, crystallize their coffee crystals and put them in cans, vacuum packed. Oh, we should thank them and really appreciate the good work that they do. Hey, processed white bread with this fluffy, and you know you can ball it up and put it on your fish hook, and it'll actually stay on there when you put it in the water. So you can catch your bluegills, like I did when I was thirteen. I feel as though you're I making. I give them credit. Um. <laughs> did you, hey, Greg? Did you answer his previous question? No, I get to that, Sam. I'm getting to it. <laughs> Right. So, uh, so uh, Greg, right. would you talk about the spirit of collaboration among craft brewers? Yeah, it's, it's simple. The reason why the, the big guys don't and, the, and the, the artisan and the craft brewers guys do, it's the commodity side of the equation. Or, I'm sorry, I'm going to point, I'm going to gesture this way towards our, our collaboration beers. It's the, it's the commodity side of the equation and the artisanal side of the equation. The commodity side is not built... Uh, on uh, creating things of uh, character and of uniqueness. They're designed, I mean, this is just a business fact. The, outside of my personal opinions, you look at the commodity side of the equation for any commodity that's to, designed for consumers, and it's designed to have large volumes, and it's designed to use advertising for perceived benefit or perceived attributes. And uh, it's designed to um, uh, take shelf space away from the other guy in the commodity realm, right? So laundry detergent uh, or fluffy white bread or the pre-wrapped cheese slices, they want to sell less of the other guys so they can sell more of theirs. So there's no incentive for them to work together. Is that, that sort of your... It's, just, it's a completely different business model. Okay. It, the idea of working together, it, it, it's... It's completely foreign as a concept. It wouldn't work. I mean, they have shareholder value that they need to maximize. They're publicly traded companies, and they have fiduciary duties to uh, maximize shareholder return. That's just a fact of the matter. Sam and I, we don't have fiduciary duties other than to be true to ourselves and true to our craft and, and the way that we like to do things. And i got to include Bill, who's not here right now, uh, but... Uh, you know, hey, uh, to Bill. Um, <laughs> don't uh, forgive me if I don't pour beer out on the floor of my office. <laughs> Disrespecting <laughs> Bill, he's not even here, you guys. Come on, Sam. Here's to Bill. <laughs> That's right. To Bill. <laughs> um, the artisanal side of the equation, we get to do it. We get to do it for the the geek side of the equation, the uh, the purity side. You know, the side that we just like what we're doing, and because. Uh, we got into it because we're beer geeks. Well, would a beer geek like a great beer, even though it's made by somebody else? But hell yeah. It's like uh, musicians. Can you imagine a great musician not appreciating another great musician? Sam was making a reference to music earlier, so, as you were, you will. Uh, of course. Of course. So, um, you know, Kenny G wants his music played instead of somebody else's, but Coltrane doesn't mind, you know, being played alongside a Brubeck, for example. Uh, I I, um, I think you make you make a really really great point um, about uh, about how craft brewers tend to be fans of beer and tend to be fans of other craft brewers. And this is a thing that I see a lot. I was just at Comic Con and I moderated some panels and I was in the green room. Uh, at Comic Con, and there were a lot of like huge, like like TV and movie stars from from TV shows and movies and things. And 
the idea is that every cast is going to be sequestered with their own cast, and no one's going to talk to each other, and you're not allowed to take pictures, you're not allowed to bug people, and it turns into this huge mingle in the center of the room because everyone is so excited to be in the same place as everybody else. And it's so cool to me to see that there are creative people who are fans of other creative people and sort of don't let the sense of competition get in the way of that. I think that's great. Right. Hey, um, um, I just got a, a text back from Bill. Let's see if I can put it up so you can see it there. Um, okay, the resolution might be tough, but uh, so I sent him a WTF because that's what friends do to each other. Right. <laughs> like, where the hell are you? And uh, I'll read it to you. He says, uh, my Chrome ain't shining tonight, and I'm lost on a safari to Google with you guys. Meaning... Yeah, I, I, I didn't uh, prematurely pour out that little bit of beer for uh, old, old Bill at Victory, so. Wow. Well, this seems like a good time for me to go ahead and open up the Victory. Hey, uh, somebody just uh, handed me this thing on. So I'm opening that right now. It's a bummer that Bill isn't here because the, uh, the Prima Pills that Victory makes uh, was actually the first Pilsner I ever had that taught me that I could really enjoy Pilsners. That's my favorite uh, Victory beer. It's, yeah, it's, uh, it's really super great. Uh, Sam, you mentioned, uh, real quickly, you mentioned after a hockey game, uh, I'm a goalie, and, uh, and, I, and I played all through high school. I played well into my uh, early 20s. I turned 40 in a couple of days, and to celebrate, uh, I've been training, and I'm going to go start playing again. And my favorite thing, man, uh, after a game is playing in a league where you can get together with the other team and have beers after the game. And... Um, uh, I don't have a question to go with that. It's just a thing that I'm it's a it's, it's a statement, not a question. It's a good statement. Yes. Well, you stick by that statement. Wow, the victory smells really good. Yeah. Unlike that dogfish crud. <laughs> uh, you know, it's interesting. Like the uh, let's talk a little bit about about the flavors, and I, I feel that I'm. It's a good thing that I've had half a beer because I'm not uh, self conscious to embarrass myself in front of two of my heroes in the craft brew world. Um, but being very able to kind, sort of, very kind. <laughs> being able to discuss the the flavors, I think, is something that people watching will be interested. So why don't we do that? Let's maybe take a take a taste of the dogfish head and and then describe it and 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 then just sort of contrast it to the victory, and then we'll do the same thing with the stone. So yeah, I've been I've I've had my victory open for a good two minutes already, trying them against each other. Um, for me, like the dogfish is is more like earthy, like herbaceous and earthy and when you with similar nose but when you drink the victory it gets very citrusy and orange notes to it when you drink it to me I get a lot of sage from the dogfish uh, uh, I grew up in the San Gabriel Valley and we have a tiny 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 little craft brewery called craftsman and they make triple a uh, white sage triple white sage. sage that's where you're going I love it he does a fantastic job I love that beer it is such an amazing beer, and it, he gets his sage from the mountains that I grew up hiking in. Yeah. So when I drink that beer, it tastes like, oh, I'm, going for, I'm hiking to the top of Mount Wilson. Um, for people watching at home uh, who follow me on, on Twitter, this is my vandalized glass uh, that was made for me by my wife. Now, it started out with the eyes in, in the correct place. Uh, but it went through the dishwasher, and they seem to have fallen down like that, which I think makes it an even more appropriate beer glass. Uh, so the victory, I get, yeah, I get almost like an orange peel kind of smell uh, off the nose. And a slightly different, like, there's sage there, but it has a different... I can taste other spices in there, and I wonder if I'm tasting the thyme in the in the victory. No, it's actually it's lemon thyme specifically, and the, yeah. the the correlation between the victory version and the stone version is that both of them used herbs from Stone Farms, our organic farm that's just about eight miles north of our brewery, and uh, so we we shipped out uh, in uh, late February, early March, uh, the shipment of, of herbaceous matter out to uh, Downingtown, Pennsylvania for them to incorporate in, in their version of the beer. Now, at Dogfish Head, 
uh, we had um, uh, planned the same thing, and then Sam said, "Oh, by the way, we're brewing, you know, January uh, 22nd this year." <laughs> I'm like, uh, "We're not ready." <laughs> it, uh, do you remember about how many pounds of herbs you had to send off to to for the for how for the batch? Oh God, that would have been one of those really excellent questions to send me in advance, Will. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought of it now. Listen, uh, somebody build a time machine <laughs> and then show up in my office right now. Guys, I'm sorry to report that time Nothing. travel remains not possible. Yes. Time um, did, anyone see the, did anyone see the Big Bang Theory uh, episode with the time machine? Well, you were on that show, weren't you? <laughs> yeah, I am. Uh, yeah, I love that. And you know that Stephen Hawking actually uh, sent out invitations to a uh, to a time travelers party, and then he didn't really publicize it. And then he went to where the time travelers were supposed to show up, and there were no time travelers there. Oh, it would, it would appear that the stupid law of the conservation of mass continues to prevent time travel. I just want a little tiny version with a bent cigar in it to show up. That's right. You know. All right, I'm going to open my stone. Uh, says on to buff now, so that I can continue with this uh, uh, comparison. I also want to thank the guys at Beer Advocate because they sent me this super fun uh, bottle opener. Uh, and what, what makes that more super fun than any other bottle opener, Will? The one that I have that you gave me that's on a belt buckle uh, that I remembered I forgot to bring here uh, into my office. Uh, uh, you could stand up and show us your crotch and open the bottle, right? Like, hey, come on, <laughs> we have yours and we got to, uh, you know, please here. Sam, okay. Uh, I did put my stone in, a, in an appropriate glass. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, Sam, uh, wow. what, what, are you wearing a belt buckle right now uh, that you can open a bottle cap? Guess, guess what percentage of my pants I'm wearing right now. <laughs> <laughs> the advantage of being at home versus being out in a public uh, area like I am, the most I can do is, is go barefoot, you know. There you go. For everyone keeping score at home, it was exactly 30 minutes from the beginning of the hangout when we officially uh, uh, had the first comment about someone not wearing pants. Yeah. Things are going very, very well. Although, for the record, Sam did make the comment to me five minutes before we started, so oh, I had I a little bit of an advantage. I, I, I kind of, it was insider's knowledge that I was uh, leading into it. Fortunately, it was insider's knowledge from um, Sam's verbalizing it only. He has uh, yet to actually stand up in front of the camera to uh, prove the point, which I'm a, well, Your flirting's getting you nowhere. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> whoa. I, I really get whoa. a lot of rose Whoa, whoa, Sam. Whoa, whoa. All right, so now we're drinking victory. No, no, no. Now we're going to drink uh, stone. And I want to, I want to mention how I, I think the the dogfish head version is, um, I think it's a, uh, it's got a crisper, stronger hop character than the victory version has. Um, so it, it was interesting that even between the 2010 version of the three and the 2012 version of the three that none of the six match each other. They're all really short variations on a theme. I think they're all really quite close, but some of the brewing system, just the vagaries of, of brewing. Yeah, so, and I, I, want, I want to add, Greg, that what you, Will, and I are doing tonight was exactly our goal in the first, uh, you know, thread of emails, which is let's use the exact same ingredients brewed at all three breweries. We know they're going to turn out a little bit different from our respective towars with the goal of people doing what we're doing tonight and drinking all three of them side by side. So I hope some of the people watching this and those that follow Will are going to, if they haven't already, seek out the opportunity to do this. This, is, this seems like a, 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 a larger scale uh, version of a thing that, that I do sometimes when home brewing where I'll take I'm still learning, so I'm figuring out how yeast works differently and how I can, you know, how small changes in atmosphere and, and, and environment can affect a uh, particular fermentation. And sometimes I'll make a five-gallon batch of homebrew, and then I'll split it into one gallons, and I'll do slightly different things to each one. And sometimes I end up with a really crappy beer, but I've learned so much from the process. And... It's so, this is really great. I, I'm getting something very different in each one of these. In the dogfish head, I'm getting a lot 
of sage. In the victory, I'm getting a lot of the lemon from the thyme. And Greg, in the stone, um, I, I get more rosemary than anything else. And there's sage underneath it, but what really hit me in the face uh, is, is the rosemary. And I think that's really cool and really interesting that that can happen from basically the same recipe. Yeah, it's it's quite fascinating, and actually a little uh, known anecdote. Oh, look at that! Right back up there in the corner of the screen, there's some kid uh, that ignored the signs that says, uh, "Stay the heck off of our our, our landscaping." Throw uh, a bottle at him! Throw a bottle at him! <laughs> down and come back into the uh, the, the community areas. Uh, thank you very much. Actually, it's, it looks to be like about 23. <laughs> Um, yeah. Hey, you kids, get off of my lawn! Greg, speaking as a father, I have to say your dad voice leaves a lot to be desired. Yeah, well, and you know what? Am I a father? Bill, yes. <laughs> Sam, yes. Will Wheaton, yes. Me? N uh, no. See, they're right there. Hey, that's great. Hey, you can kid! Make you hey, kid. That, this reminds me of that video in slow motion of the Sasquatch that they think really existed walking in the in the background. <laughs> um, so where was I? You were talking about having children. Oh yeah, um, I want to have. Let's see, how many do I want? Uh... <laughs> you can't divide by zero. That's mathematically impossible. Let's go um, to a couple of questions from Twitter. Um, these were we asked people all day today to use the ta uh, hashtag #HangBuff. Uh, to submit some questions to us, and uh, there, as it turns out, uh, the we've, we've pulled four of them out right now. Maybe we'll grab a couple more before we're done. These are all relevant to the things we've been talking about. So question number one, you guys, if someone wanted to try and clone this recipe to brew it at home, are, do you have any tips on when the spices, and I think by spices he means herbs, should be added for the truest flavor? That's well, one thing we did. We did, we did that the exact same way, or at the exact same point in each uh, brew, which is really the end of the hot side. You want them to be on the hot side, uh, so that if there's any little bugs and critters on the herbs themselves, they're not introduced when it's cold and can overtake the yeast or introduce wild yeast into the process. But you want to do it as late as you can on the hot side. So you're keeping as much of the aromatics from those spices as possible. But the fun thing is, the other, the other, our breweries kind of all lacked the uh, sophisticated design systems to add these uh, herbs in a very uh, mechanized way. So it involved the three of us, you know, stuffing them into mesh bags, having pillow fights with the mesh bags and then dropping chunks of stainless steel in the mesh bags, tying them in and throwing them into the, the kettle or the whirlpool, right? And, you know, the, the, I, I, the pillow fight version, or when we did the pillow fight with the mesh bags, it kind of reminded me of that one scene from Zoolander. Um, they were using gas nozzles, but it was, it was a, a really intimate moment that Sam and Bill and I got to share. And, and, but, uh, and, and with the 20, we learned so much from the 2010 brew sessions that we incorporated in the 2012, like have the pillow fight before you put the chunks of stainless steel in the mesh bags. <laughs> <laughs> so would you advise homebrewers to, to, to do their, their herb additions like 10 at 10 at 15, something like that? Or even, or even earlier, even closer, like maybe around 30? Greg, I don't know about you, but I'd say like five minutes before end of boil or rate it end of boil while it's, while it's cooling boil. down. Yeah, and, and to boil, yeah. um, because it doesn't take a lot to get the, uh, the I mean, hey, look at uh, rosemary, for example. It really, when you, when you cook with rosemary, you have to be extraordinarily cautious because a little goes a very, very long way. So it doesn't take a lot to assimilate its character into the beer. In fact, you know, Will, because you're asking, I'm uh, reflecting on the fact that we haven't uh, actually written up and shared this recipe. Sam, what do you think? Should we uh, check with Bill and see if he's okay with us publicly sharing the Saison de Buff recipe for home brewing? I, I feel like we have a quorum because he's opted out of this event. We could just vote right now. And I actually Will... have, uh, I have been given uh, uh, Bill's proxy. It looks, uh, this is his proxy. 
And Bill, <laughs> says, and, and Bill has uh, said that he will vote uh, actually with the majority to share this recipe with home brewers the world or. Can you shake that little thing and it acts like one of those eight balls? Yeah, actually I can. And it says, publish the home brewing recipe. <laughs> I'll be darned. It always says oh. that. Yeah. Uh, you know what? Uh, off screen, uh, Mr. Randy Clemens Esquire, that's uh, at Randy Clemens ESQ, just reminded me that it is in the uh, book entitled The Craft of Stone Brewing uh, Liquid Lore Epic Recipes and Unabashed Arrogance on 10 Speed, which is an uh, a, a imprint of Random House, available at your finer bookstores or on Amazon.com now. Uh, hey, if that someone recipe, had that book yeah. sitting right behind him, would he maybe go get it and show it to the class? I, I don't know. I'm I just curious if it's the exact one I'm thinking about, uh, Will. Uh, in the meantime, I did get a, um, uh, a text from, from Bill. Nice. Oh, look at that. Uh, you, know, did, did you, you know, you can get that signed by the author sometimes, Will, if you're really lucky. What Perhaps about on like, Tuesday? Hurry next week? Yeah. <laughs> um, so Bill, Bill writes in... Uh, Watching in digital frustration. You look charming this eve. I, I think that was aimed at. Um, Clearly, that was aimed at me. Will, Will, that's yeah. that's it. Um, so, uh, Bill, yes, you can ex expect a, uh, a signed eight by ten glossy of Will coming in the mail for you, suitable for framing. Uh, and he also mentioned a DF. H version that stands for Dogfish Head in you know craft brew um, vernacular. Uh, DF version is tasting fine, sharp, and uh, usually, the, does he ever talk about you or your brewery, Sam, without using the word luscious? I think not. He used the word luscious, yeah. A Very kind, Bill. A little bit predictable, Bill, but appreciate it all the same. Let me ask another question on behalf of home brewers, and I mean on behalf of myself. Uh, for those of us who aren't brewing in quantities sufficient to, uh, to justify an exciting uh, herb uh, pillow fight. Uh, would you recommend muddling herbs or, or just sort of like maybe crushing them before you put in? When my son Ryan and I made our honey sage seasonal out of the Brooklyn Brew Shop cookbook uh, last year, uh, we just chopped it up and then kind of, I kind of like rubbed it between my hands and dumped it in. I think in about five minutes. I can't remember exactly when I did that. Uh, but how would you recommend do it? If how would you recommend to home brewers that they do this? Well, it it does remind me. Uh, you know, what do you get when you cross uh, an elephant with a rhinoceros? What's that? Elephino. Oh, jeez, that's oh, good. Oh yeah. Okay. So, um, <laughs> hey, Will, I, I'm Sam. I'm thinking that you probably. Don't want to muddle it, uh, the, the herbs. We didn't when we did it, and uh, we I added in the whirlpool. It would change your volumes. It would change your volumes. You you know you yeah. get so much more out of it if you were kind of just uh, mortar and pestling uh, your your herbs before you put it in. You'd probably get too much extract out of it, uh, Sam. Well, it, it also uh, we we kept ours whole. We added it to the whirlpool. And since it was in a mesh pat bag, if we chopped it up a ton, it would have all the solids would have come out of that uh, mesh bag and probably plugged up the heat exchanger. That's obviously something you don't have to worry about at home. You probably get a little bit better utilization if you chop the crap out of it into finer uh, bits. But you probably want to do one more carboy transfer if you do that because you're going to get a lot of sol solids. Now, if you're just using rosemary, which is probably the most intense of the four, it's going to be in such a small volume for a five-gallon batch that I, I don't know if you need an extra transfer from the carboy. Speaking of rosemary, though, I agree with you, Will. Rosemary's uh, probably the most forward in the stone batch. Uh, I think it's a wonderful beer where I'd say ours is uh, more earthy and I get more search, uh, citrusy lemon grass out of, uh, uh, out of the victory batch. This one for me tastes like walking through a, a forest or, you know, cutting a tree down on a few days before Christmas type of flavors. It, it does have that sort of um, winter pine forest kind of a character, really fresh, crisp, and aromatic. This is stuff in the air that, that uh, it's actually kind of, uh, it's really that, that, that refreshing kind of a character. And, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, the big brewers have kind of stolen that term from us, but I'm going to use it all the same. 
I think that there are a lot of homebrewers watching this right now that are really, really excited to develop uh, their own recipe or make out of the craft of stone brewing, make this recipe. Because, uh, I mean, I, like, I know, uh, just for myself, uh, I'm thinking of like all the different kinds of herbs that I can put into uh, a beer right now to, to make something amazing. Hey, um, let me let me let me just suggest this. Randy Clemens, a co-author on the the book, the Stone Brewing book. Hey, Randy, what do you think if we just um, go ahead and blog post the recipe so people don't even have to buy the book if they don't want to? We can blog post it. We want them to buy the book, but we can blog post. He it. he wants them to buy the book, but but he said we could blog post it. So uh, I support you. Go. Listen, I as as someone who makes a a, a very good living as an independent self-published author, uh, I can I can encourage you to to publish it because someone will make it, they will love it, and then they will go and buy your book to make the other recipes that are in it. And, nice. and uh, I can also tell you that my very first all-grain batch was the stone pale ale recipe out of the craft of stone brewing. Uh, so um, thank you Did for... Did it turn uh, out well? Sorry? Did it turn out well? It turned out unbelievably well. Uh, yeah. it, was, it was such a fun... It, you know, it was, there's that... There's that like equal mixture of joy and terror when I went to the local homebrew supply, and I will plug Eagle Rock Homebrew Supply. It's a fantastic homebrew place here in LA. Uh, I I went there and I showed the my, the guy that owns the place, and I was like, I'm going all green, and I took many 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 pounds of pale malt and crushed it, and I was like, here we go, and uh, you know converting a cooler into a mash tun was so exciting for me. And uh, I still do extract brews, but I, uh, I don't know, I feel sort of like, I feel like an alchemist when I'm working with, uh, with nothing but grains. You, you, were, you were like doing touchdown dance kind of things, weren't you, when you were doing your first uh, all grain? Oh, the whole time. I was doing the Will Flail. If you, uh, if you look online for, uh, if you just Google willflail.gif, you'll see yeah. all the way around. I um, have no <laughs> idea what you're talking about. There's another question from Twitter. This is from Ken Hawk, and he says, what was the first beer that opened your eyes to craft beers? Um, and while you guys think about that, actually, I'll answer that. Um, the very first craft beer I ever had was Rogue's Red Ale. I was in college, and I was roommates with Chris Hardwick uh, of Nerdist Industries, and Chris had a friend who really loved craft beer, and this was in 1991, and, uh, uh, like, Nirvana time. none of us really knew, like, that beer could be a thing that wasn't, like, we sort of made fun of beer, right? We were like, beer's a thing that, that goes with race cars and, and sorority girls, and we were just sort of like, we're not in a fraternity enough to drink beer, and Chris's friend said, you just haven't had the right beer. You need to have microbrewed beer. And he brought some Rogue. And uh, I had this beer, and I was like, oh, my God, where have you been all my life? This is amazing. And uh, it was Rogue's Red Ale that made me fall in love with craft beer before we called it craft beer. And uh, that led me to uh, uh, what has become a lifetime passion uh, for craft beer and, as it turns out, homebrewing beer. Awesome. And, and uh, Sam, Sam, you were kind of, you just, you kind of, your, your, your trajectory between discovering that there was such a thing as craft beer or, what, you know, microbrews, what it was called back in those days, and actually, like, starting your own brew was really short, right? Yeah, it was about, I, I tried my first really good beers in one week. I, I was working at a beer bar in New York City, and I tried... Uh, Chimay Red and uh, I think Sierra Nevada Celebration the same week. So it was like an epiphany week, not an epiphany moment. And uh, uh, the next week I went and brought a, bought a homebrew kit and, uh, you know, the first day that I uh, tr tried my first batch um, was uh, the day that I stood up in front of my roommates and said, this is what I want to do with my life. I want to open a brewery. So I think it was about a year and a half after that that dogfish open with pretty much a homebrewing system, like 12 gallons at a time. So, so that shows you the achiever that I am, because my first discovery of real beer was years before Sam, 
but he opened his brewery a year before we did at Stone. So, you know, power to you, brother, just diving right in. Uh, who cares if it's legal to have a brew pub in Delaware, right? Yeah, we don't let little things like that get in our way here in Delaware, but uh, thank you, Greg. <laughs> where, did, where did you start, Greg? What was your first uh, experience with craft beer? Well, I used to go to this really cool little dive bar. I mean, this is the epitome of dive bar. It wasn't old school, sort of whatever, artist loft, industrial side of L.A., downtown L.A. dive bar. It was called Al's Bar. No sign on the door. Uh, and they just had a little portal window. Anyways, you go inside, everything covered with graffiti. It was, I don't even remember, but probably all of 800 square feet, maybe 1,000 square feet inside. They had four beers on tap, and uh, they would serve it in wax-coated paper cups. Uh, and as a, as a poor college student, I would always get the 24-ounce cup versus the 16-ounce cup because it was, a, you know, I didn't have to be that far along in my college career to figure out that the price per ounce was better, uh, you know, the economics were better. But I was education! Was, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I uh, was, uh, uh, you totally threw me there, Will. Where was I? Oh, yeah. So you were having 24-ounce cups instead of 12-ounce cups because yeah. you would do the math and you would figure it out that, that it worked better. Oh, yes. Perfect. So, um... Anyways, uh, because I wasn't a beer chugger even back then, I just the idea of just like slamming down beers, sort of uh, buffoonery style, it wasn't really my style. I would uh, drink the beer at a normal-ish pace, and uh, the normal beers that I was used to drinking uh, would really taste like, yeah, not very good by the time they got down to the last bit. Well, they had Anchor Steam on tap, and I discovered it was Anchor Steam as it started to warm up, it still tasted pretty damn good. And I had that epiphany moment. It was like, you know, I didn't actually know the beer could taste like this. And my, my journey was longer than Sam's. Uh, living in L.A. at that time, it was, this was 1987, if I didn't mention. So living in L.A. at the time, there was not a lot of opportunity for tasting craft beers. Um, yeah, Anchor was pretty much it back then, right? Like, Anchor started up in the mid-70s, and had and, and finally made its way to L.A. in the mid-80s, right? I, you know, I honestly don't know when it came to the 80s. Fritz Maytag kind of bought it in uh, 64, 65, but struggled for many years yeah. and very small production level. Eventually came to, you know, Southern California. I have no idea when they made the first foray, but I discovered it personally in 1987. And my journey down the rabbit hole took uh, a few years until I uh, took a little extension course at UC Davis just on a Saturday day class called A Century Evaluation of Beer in maybe 92, 93. And Steve Wagner, my business partner, he was also in that class as well. I'd met him once before in the music industry through a common friend, but it wasn't more than just a hi, nice to meet you. Recognized him. Hey. And uh, we started our conversation in beer. That class at Davis seems to be patient zero for a lot of West Coast uh, craft brews. I hear so many people talk about how they went there and, and participated in that class. And, and Anchor and Sierra Nevada seem to be two big California breweries that, that really sort of reached people in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, uh, and, and sort of started to spread craft beer. Did that stuff make it to the East Coast, Sam? Um, it did. It did. I know you guys think on the East Coast that uh, we don't get things until about 20 years after you guys. But you have cars there now, right? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Your your hop shipment is still on its way, and it hasn't arrived yet. I don't. That's puzzling. That's puzzling. That, that gives me a wonderful opportunity to remind everyone of a brewery called Ballantines that was making super hoppy beers when Ken Grossman was in diapers, raging New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> that was New Jersey, people. Look it up. Uh, <laughs> on Google+, Plus, um, I have a circle called beer, and uh, I'll share it. I'll publicly share it again. I do it every few months. Uh, but I circled uh, the Anchor Brewing Company, and they write these super awesome blog posts about the history of beer, the history of styles of beer, um, that 
I don't know, it just kind of elevates beer beyond a thing that we love to drink, that we enjoy making, and, uh, and, and it gives it this, like, this sense of being alive, this thing that has really mattered to history. And uh, and they're they're really it's it's really really worth uh, worth reading. Let me let me take another couple of questions from Twitter. Uh, we'll do a couple of, uh, of questions that I think are relative to home brewers, and uh, and then and then switch over to some things that are about the business of uh, of running uh, a craft brewery. Okay. Um, this uh, speed round. Yeah, this is the speed round. Yeah. So uh, John uh, wants to know if you guys do another collaboration. Uh, is there a particular style that you think you'll go for? That, I'll take that. That's the beauty of collaboration. I have no idea, and that's what's great about it. That's the essence of collaboration. You get together, you start a conversation, the what if, and you do things you would have never done by yourself. Uh, think of it as a musical collaboration, two artists that you like getting together, or if you play music yourself, getting together with somebody you've never gotten together with before. You're going to create something new out of that. So as a result, I don't want to limit myself by surmising what it might be. Do you think that Stone might, you know, Stone is so well known for big, powerful beers. The first Stone beer I had was the Arrogant Bastard on the surf liner going home from Comic-Con. And that was my introduction to all of your beers. Do you think that Stone would ever do something that's that's way off style from Stone, like a wheat beer, or or uh, or maybe something that that is that is that is not like a hot monster? Yeah, oh, something really um, awesome, like say maybe a, a really nice uh, gentle uh, raspberry wheat. Um, the answer uh, is uh, no. Oh, that was really unpleasant for the home viewers, I'm certain. But it was nice to see your teeth so much. Yeah. Sam, I, I love the Ur Continent, uh, and I love how you pulled things together from basically everywhere to do that. Do you, uh, do, do you see Dogfish Head doing some uh, collaborations uh, maybe with, with other brewers? And, and uh, I love how you, how you said, like, you know, there's, there's nothing we won't try. I think that's so cool. Uh, but is there something you would just love to do that you haven't done yet? Um, well, Urcon is actually a fun one that we did with with friends at at Google, and I was up at I was up in their New York uh, uh, headquarters two two nights ago, and uh, when we did that beer, we we asked for every Google office from around the world to put in recipe ideas, and while we I think only chose five that we added to that beer, the, it gave us this giant. Uh, kind of a bag full of tricks that we've yet to access of other great uh, ingredients that came out of that. But no, there's pretty much nothing that we won't consider. We, when the, over that hundred, that hundred something ideas came in, the only ones we knocked off the list were ones that were toxic and would kill you. Uh, or, uh, ones that were to, or, or ones that were totally illegal. And that's kind of been our, our way into this since we opened, it was basically a dogfish off-centered ales was basically look at the entire culinary landscape as an opportunity for something to include in beer. Uh, one of my uh, favorite things about being a home brewer is uh, meeting other home brewers and the home brewer community is just really supportive and forums like Homebrew Talk and uh, the subreddit for home brewing on, on Reddit has helped me so much uh, in an appreciation of beer and a, uh, my ability to develop recipes. And there's a, uh, I, I posted about this on Reddit so that other homebrewing Redditors would come and watch this tonight. And uh, one of my fellow Redditors had a question. So I will throw this to you guys. He says, um, I've been at Extract for about a year now. I've done one all grain. I'd like to do my own recipes, but I have no idea where to start. So I'm sure that you guys were at that place at some point in your life where you were sort of like ready to go to the next level but unsure how to do it. Uh, I was there a few months ago. Um, if you could just give this guy advice or encouragement, uh, what would it be, Sam? Uh, I'd say go back to the original homebrewing Bible, Charlie Papazian's Joy of Homebrewing. Uh, has some nice, uh, you know, just a few pages long about you know making that transition from 
uh, extract to partial grain to all grain, uh, which is pretty amazing when you think he was first teaching that homebrew course in, I think, Boulder 40 years ago, and that, that's stuff, that stuff still holds up. So that's a place to look. Um, and then online homebrewing forums are also great for that. But kind of like the independent bookstores that are getting more and more marginalized, don't underestimate how great it is to have homebrew stores in your neighborhood. You know, I love sites like Beer Beer and More Beer and, and some online uh, websites. Uh, but to actually go into a homebrew store like Home Sweet Homebrew near us in Philadelphia or uh, Delmarva Brewing Supplies here in Delaware and actually talk to that guy and say, hey, I'm going to make this move, they, that's the, the best thing ever is actually communicating with a human being instead of uh, reading about it and uh, getting the confidence by talking to another brewer. Yeah. I wrote a blog post about this. I went to my local homebrew shop. It was my son's idea. Ryan was home visiting uh, right before he graduated college. And he said, let's do a father-son activity all summer. And I said, great, what do you want to do? And he said, let's, let's make beer. And uh, I was afraid of it. I thought it was too hard. I thought it was a thing that I couldn't do. We went to Eagle Rock. And the guy, I said to the guy, I don't know what to do. And he said, let me help you out. It's so easy. And he walked me through it. And I never would have started if that guy hadn't been friendly and reassuring and, uh, and welcoming. So uh, I, I, uh, just to sort of uh, plus one your idea of, of going to local homebrew shops and sort of keeping that community going because it's beyond us, right? It's for the guy that's walking in tomorrow yeah. who's never done it and needs a place to go. And I, I always recommend, my number one uh, recommendation to folks that are interested in homebrewing, check out a homebrew club. Find people that are homebrewing near you they're so welcoming. Uh, you know, hey, we're, we're geeks, right? We uh, crave social interaction, but we're not very good at it. Okay. We're socially uh, awkward penguins. Yay, yeah, hey, there you go. So these guys, you know, the homebrewers, the really accomplished homebrewers in your area, they're excited to share what they've got with you. Go homebrew with somebody. Uh, it's easy to find a local homebrew club on, uh, you know, in your area, and your knowledge curve is like that. Yeah. Okay, last question, because we've been at this for an hour and we all have things to do. Okay. Um, I, uh, well, let me, let me butt bo bo in. Actually, let uh, Bill Kovaleski from Victory Brewing butt in, courtesy of a uh, uh, text that he sent me here. So uh, he says, uh, listening, doing email, drinking. <laughs> it sounds like my sure. evenings. Uh, done with tech tonight. Uh, guess we'll have to try again soon and do another hangout. Everyone in question mark. Yeah, I'll do this again. I'm in. There you go. I, I'm, I, I, hey, look, i got to look at my calendar. I'm pretty busy, um, but I'll see. I'll, I'll do my best. Oh, you suck. Sam, you want to do this without Greg? I'm, I'm willing. I'm oh, willing to do on, it. Oh, come on, guys. I was just kidding. <laughs> I was kidding. Pick me. Pick me. Greg, that guy... Um, that guy, that guy's behind you again, whatever that, in the woods. Made you oh, look. Oh, I knew that was coming. <laughs> Made you look. What's that on your, right in your uh, shirt nope. there? No. Nope. Oh, nope. Okay, so we'll go ahead, last we'll... question from Twitter that, that yeah. I think is actually, this is a fantastic question and is, a, uh, is, is relevant to my interests as well. This is from John. He says, what is the best way to break into the craft beer industry. I mean, you guys are fantastically successful. Uh, uh, my, my son and I talk about uh, Stone being the West Coast Dogfish Head and Dogfish Head being the East Coast Stone. You guys have created beers that are so, like, when you started making them, these are beers that just didn't seem like, oh, yeah, they're going to be successful, but we love them. And you have found people and inspired people all over the country and all over the world to drink your beers. And you're sort of living the dream of a lot of home brewers. So what does someone do to take their home brewing operation and, and, and uh, take a stab at entering the craft brew world? I'll take a whack first, Greg, and then you go. Um... That's a great question, like you said, Will. Um, I'd say, first of all, go to beertown.org, which is a great landing site for folks moving 
from considering moving on to commercial from, from home brewing, uh, the craft brewers conference that moves around the country every day to actually see it. But really, I think the best way it starts is to go from your house to the closest local brewery in your community and sit at the bar and have a pint and say, I'd like to meet the brewer, and hopefully they're there, and you get to really talk to someone face-to-face uh, -face about what that's like. Um, and thank you, Will, for the kind words on our two breweries, but I know Will, I know Bill's out there and hasn't gotten to chime in other than a few texts, so I do want to say to those that are, are listening, uh, visit Victory Brewery 2. A very, very quick plug for them. They're in Downingtown, Pennsylvania. Uh, they're about to build a 200-barrel brew house about 20 minutes from their Downingtown location. If you go to Downingtown, that'll always stay going as their R&D brewery. They have a restaurant there. Uh, uh, and that's my, my plug for our brother, Bill. I'm going to chime in right there and then let you finish, Sam. You know, so many beer enthusiasts, when they visit your brewery, they visit my brewery, they're kind of like, oh! And that's how I feel. Well, honestly, when I visit Dogfish Head, but also Victor, it's just, you walk in the doors and you're like, I'm home. I'm home. This is this is my happy place. I recommend and, one, it. And, and the average American, the average American lives within 10 miles of a local brewery. So to that question, as a home brewer, just figure out what breweries are 10 miles from you. That's awesome, and I think that's a great place to leave it. So you guys, um, like, I'm a fan uh, as well as as a as a guy who kind of moderates things. So it's such a uh, – uh, Greg, we're friends. It's lovely to see you always. Sam, I have loved your beer for so long, and it really has been my unbelievable pleasure and honor to talk with you. So Happy, uh, happy 40th, Will. Happy 40th. Uh, thanks a lot, man. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. I hope that you've learned some stuff. I hope that you've been entertained. Uh, remember, uh, it's Victory Brewing, Dogfish Head, and the Stone Brewing Company – I'm Will Wheaton, I'm at Will W on Twitter, and I post like crazy about home brewing on my Google Plus account. So, uh, everybody? I'm out of here. Cheers to everybody. I'm at Stone Greg, and it's been great hanging out, drinking beers with Will, Bill, and Spirit, and Sam. Cheers, you guys. Drink more beer, everybody. Good night. Good night, all.